Hello, Discovery Learners. It is I, Teacher Liz, here, your host once more for this episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. It's Monday, so of course I have new observances, history lessons, animals and plants to see, a new place to explore, and of course some Spanish words to learn. And be sure you're logging in for the Zoom sessions provided to you every day by the Discovery Educational Team. So let's not delay anymore. Let's start the show. And now for our daily observances. Our first observance is National Bubble Wrap Day. National Bubble Wrap Day also known as National Bubble Wrap Appreciation Day, on the last Monday in January recognizes a fascinating piece of invention. Today, Bubble Wrap's primary purpose is to protect fragile items either in shipping or storage. Of course, people also take enjoyment from popping the bubbles in Bubble Wrap too. However, when two engineers created Bubble Wrap, the use of packing didn't pop into their heads right away. Mark Chavan and Alfred Fielding first sealed two shower curtains together in 1956 in the town of Hawthorne, New Jersey. This technique created a smattering of air bubbles. Two engineers initially thought their creation would make great wallpaper. However, the sales of the wallpaper never materialized. So Chavans and Fielding moved to sell the product as a greenhouse insulation. The product was originally named AirCap and was produced by Sealed Air Corporation which founded in 1960. In 1961, the product evolved into the bubble wrap we know today when it was used to protect IBM's 1401 computer when it started shipping. Sealed Air Corporation trademarked bubble wrap and has been filling shipping needs ever since. So how do we observe bubble wrap day? Wrap something up in bubble wrap. Find an old piece and have some fun popping the bubbles. Another way to enjoy the day is by reading polka dot books inspired by bubble wrap. These books allow you to pop bubbles over and over while reading the story to your child or to yourself. Our next observance is National Opposite Day. The Opposite National on January 25th celebrates the fun day of switcheroos. What better way to not celebrate? I don't really mean that. Or do I? Good morning. Or is it good night? Hello? Or is it goodbye? I am cold or I am hot. The aim of the day is to have fun all day long saying exactly the opposite of what you really mean. This day has kids and the kids at heart rejoicing everywhere. It is also a great day for adults to play along and break out of the winter blues. Maybe we should have dinner for breakfast and breakfast for dinner. Most sources say that opposite day is always observed on January 25th, while other sources say it is celebrated by some on January 7th. It is also believed to be celebrated by a group of people on the 25th of each month of the year. So how do you observe National Opposite Day? Spend the day exploring opposites. Read about the North and South Poles. Express opposite emotions like sad and happy, excited and disappointed. Experiment with opposite flavors. Taste sour and sweet, spicy and bland. What's the opposite of bitter? Play opposite sounds. Whisper then shout, cry then laugh. Our last observance for today is National Irish Coffee Day. National Irish Coffee Day kicks off January 25th each year with a mug of strong coffee, Irish whiskey, sugar, and topped with a layer of cream. On a cold, wet day in 1942, weary travelers at a small Shannon airport in Southwest Ireland found their way to a restaurant and Chef Joe Sheridan. To warm his guests, he served them hot coffee, spiked with whiskey and topped with whipped cream. The passengers asked if the beverage was Brazilian coffee. Sheridan responded that it was Irish coffee. A travel writer, Staten Delaplane, brought Irish coffee to the United States after having it at the Shannon Airport. Delaplane brought the idea to the Buena Vista Cafe on November 10, 1952, after much trial and error, sampling, and a trip back to Ireland for a taste of the original. Delaplane, along with Buena Vista owners Jack Copler and George Freeberg, were able to replicate the delicious coffee and the method for floating cream at the top of the coffee. So 
also how do you observe National Irish Coffee Day? Warm up with a cup of Irish coffee. Or you could pause here and write down your recipe to make your own cup of Irish coffee at home. On this day in history. Today in 1850, Alta, California becomes a daily newspaper, the first ever in California. The Daily Alta, California descended from the, from the first newspaper published in the city, the California Star, which debuted on January 9, 1847. Owner and editor Steve Brannan, who had earlier assisted in publishing several Mormon newspapers in New York City, had brought a small press with him when he immigrated to California as a part of a group of Mormon settlers in 1846. With Dr. E.B. Jones as editor, the California Star was the city's first and only newspaper until an older publication. The Californian moved to Yerba Buena, which was the original name of San Francisco back then, from Monterey in mid-1847. The city was about to undergo rapid changes as the California Gold Rush got underway. The California Star appeared weekly until June 14, 1848, when it was forced to shut down because of its entire staff had departed for the gold fields. Its rival newspaper had suspended publication for the same reason on May 29th. Later that year, Sam Brennan sold his share of the California Star to Edward Cleveland Kimball, who also acquired the Californian. Kimball reassumed publication of the combined papers under the name Star and the Californian on November 18, 1848. On December 23, 1848, the California Star and the Californian ran an article indicating it would be its last issue. In a business agreement with the firm of Gilbert Kimball and Hubbard, a new paper entitled Alta California will be published in San Francisco. Upper California, the first issue would appear on Thursday, January 4th, 1849. By 1849, the paper had become under the control of Robert B. Semple, who changed the name to Alta California. On January 25th, the paper began daily production, becoming the first daily newspaper in California. The newspaper continued production until June 2nd, 1891. Today, in 1961, Walt Disney's animated film, 101 Dalmatians, based on the novel by Dodie Smith, is released in the U.S. 101 Dalmatians is a 1961 American animated adventure comedy film produced by Walt Disney Productions and based on the 1956 novel 101 Dalmatians by Dodie Smith. It was directed by Clyde Jeremy and it was Disney's 17th animated featured film. The film tells the story of a litter of Dalmatian puppies who are kidnapped by the villainous Cruella de Vil who wants to use their fur to make into a spotted fur coat. Their parents, Pongo and Perdita, set out to save their children from Corella, in the process rescuing 84 additional puppies that were stolen from pet shops, bringing a total of donations to 101. The film was originally released in theaters on January 25, 1961, and was a box office success, pulling the studio out of financial slump caused by Sleeping Beauty a costlier production released two years prior. Aside from its box office revenue, its commercial success was due to an employment of inexpensive animation techniques, such as using xerography. During the process of linking and painting traditional animation cells, they kept production costs down. Disney would later release a live-action adaptation film named 101 Dalmatians in 1996 and its sequel 102 Dalmatians in the year 2000. A direct-to-video animated sequel to the 1961 film named 101 Dalmatians 2, Patches London Adventure, was released in 2003. Wow, isn't history awesome? Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure for today is Robert Burns. Born January 25th, 1759 in Scotland. This major Scottish poet associated with the Romantic movement and known for such poems, songs as All Lang Sine, also known as the New Year's Song, and A Red Red Rose. The first edition of his Scottish dialect poems was published in 1786. Before he was famous, he worked as a farmhand in his younger years. He grew up in Alloway, Scotland, and he was the oldest of seven children. 
He unfortunately passed away July 21st, 1796 at the age of 37. But he is considered Scotland's national poet. Happy birthday, Robert. Our next notable figure is Etta James. Born January 25th, 1938 in Los Angeles, California. This American blues singer who released such hits as At Last and Something's Got a Hold on Me won multiple awards like Best Traditional Blues Album. Before she was famous, her single Dance With Me Henry helped launch her career as a track that made a hot rhythm and blues track. She unfortunately passed away January 20th of 2012 at the age of 73. But a year before her death, she received a Grammy Hall of Fame award for At Last. She released her first album in 1960 and her last album in 2011. Happy birthday, Etta! Another notable figure for today is another singer, Jennifer Lewis. Born January 25th, 1957 in Kinloch, Missouri. This American backup singer, who became a voice and screen actress, providing her voice for the Disney animated films Cars and Princess and the Frog. Her roles in Dreamgirls and Beaches brought her additional fame. She's also appeared in Blackish since 2014. Before she was famous, she made her acting debut in the Broadway musical Eby in 1979. In The Princess and the Frog, she provided the voice for Mama Oldie. She turned 64 years old today. Happy birthday, Jennifer! And our final notable figure for today is someone most of you may recognize, Alicia Keys. Born January 25th, 1981 in New York City, New York. This American R&B singer was the first singer to receive five Grammy Awards at once after releasing her debut album, Songs in a Mirror, which included Fallen in 2001. Her hit album Girl on Fire earned her her 15th career Grammy Award in 2014 when it was named the best R&B album. Before she was famous, she appeared on an episode of The Cosby Show, studying Mozart and Chopin, and graduated from the Professional Performing Arts School as Valedictorian. Her album Songs in a Mirror sold over 12 million copies. She has also been a judge on the singing competition show The Voice. She turns 40 years old today. Wow! Happy birthday, Alicia! Happy birthday, everyone! Come along as we take a journey to the place of the week. This week we are traveling to the United Kingdom. Do you hear that music in the background, Discovery Learners? That's the UK's national anthem. Let's go ahead and take a deeper look at the UK's flag. This national flag is red, white, and blue, which are combined crosses of St. George for England, St. Andrew for Scotland, and St. Patrick for Ireland. Initially, the Union flag was called a jack only when it was flown at the bows of British naval vessels, but it was commonly called the Union Jack by the late 17th century. Now either name is acceptable. The flag is flown on land for government and military purposes, and at sea it serves as a flag of the Royal Navy. The general public uses it unofficially as a civil flag. Wow, this is a really iconic looking flag. The United Kingdom is an island country located off the northwestern coast of mainland Europe. The United Kingdom comprises the whole of island of Great Britain, which contains England, Wales, and Scotland, as well as the northern portion of the island of Ireland. The name Britain is sometimes used to refer to the United Kingdom as a whole. The United Kingdom's official name is United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Its form of government is a constitutional monarchy with two legislative houses, the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Its head of state is a sovereign monarchy, currently ruled by Queen Elizabeth II. It also has a Prime Minister. The United Kingdom's capital is London, and its official language is English. Both English and Scots Gaelic in Scotland, both English and Welsh in Wales. 
the most popular religion in the United Kingdom is Christianity, followed closely second by Muslim, and its main monetary unit is the pound sterling. One US dollar equals 0.73 British pounds. Currently, US money is worth less than the pound sterling. The UK's current population is 67 million. 363,000 people, and it has a total area of 93,630 square miles. That is around the same size as the U.S. state of Colorado. Some of the main exports of the U.K. is machinery including computers, vehicles, gems and precious metals, oil, and pharmaceuticals. And its main money-making industry is banking. Followed closely second by tourism. Wow, the United Kingdom is a pretty neat place. I actually have an English grandmother who lived about 40 miles away from its capital, London. The United Kingdom, also known as Great Britain, is a very interesting place. Can't wait to teach you more about it. So be sure to stay tuned all week to Ability to Learn to learn more about the United Kingdom. Here is the animal of the day. Today's animal is the Eurasian blackbird. Blackbirds is a songbird that belongs to the family of thrushes. It originates from Eurasia. There are 13 subspecies of blackbirds that can be found around the world today. Blackbird inhibits forests, beaches, marshes, and mountains. It can also be found in suburban and urban areas, in the parks, gardens, orchards, and vineyards. Population of blackbirds is large and stable. Here are some interesting facts about the blackbird. Blackbirds can reach up to 9 or 11 inches in length and about 2 to 4 ounces of weight. Males and females can be differentiated by the color of their plumage. Males have a black body and a gold rings around their eyes and yellow beaks. Females have brown bodies and a rusty red chest covered with streaks. Their beaks are dark colored. Blackbird is an omnivore. It eats plants and meat. Its diet is based on insects, worms, slugs, seeds, fruits, and berries. Blackbirds occasionally eat small amphibians and lizards. The blackbird will use its strong beak to pull out insects and caterpillars hidden in the soil. It also searches for food below leaf and litter and inside of trees. Northern populations of blackbirds migrate towards Africa and tropical parts of Asia before the winter time. They live in small flocks on the wintering grounds. Young, like one-year-old males, start to sing at the end of January or the beginning of February. Older birds usually sing from March to June or July, and they also produce beautiful, melodic, fluty songs. Some subspecies of blackbirds are able to mimic sounds of cats, humans, and other birds. They also produce various alarm calls to alert other members of the group about oncoming danger. Natural enemies of the blackbirds are cats, foxes, large birds of prey, such as the sparrowhawk. The mating season for the blackbird starts in March. One pair usually produces two broods per season. Blackbirds are territorial during mating season. They form monogamous couples, which are pairs that mate for life and protect their territory from intruders. Blackbirds build up cut-shaped nests in treetops or in shrubs. Males collect twigs, bark, mud, and leaves while females use them to construct the nest. Entire process lasts about 11 to 14 days. The mama blackbird can lay up to 3 to 5 bluish green eggs covered with red blotches. Males provide food for the female during the incubation period which lasts about 17 days. Cuckoo birds often lay their eggs inside blackbird's nests. Luckily, the blackbirds easily recognize the different colored eggs and eliminate them from their own nests. Both parents provide food for their offspring. Young blackbirds are ready to leave the nest in 13 days after hatching, but they're not ready to be independent at life until another three weeks. Blackbirds can survive 16 to 20 years in the wild, but they rarely live more than two years. That's probably because they get eaten. <laughs> The plant of the day. 
Today's plant is the camellia. The camellia is an evergreen plant that belongs to the tea family. There are about 100 to 250 species of camellia that are native to southern and eastern parts of Asia. Camellia can be found at an altitude nearly 5,000 feet. These plants grow in cool areas, on moist, well-drained soil in partial shade. Camellias do not tolerate drought and require a regular water supply. There are more than 3,000 cultivars of camellia that are available around the world today. They are cultivated because of their leaves that are used for manufacture of tea and in decorative purposes, both as ornamental garden plants and cut as flowers used for the preparation of various floral arrangements. Here are some interesting facts about the camellia. Camellia can grow in the form of a small tree or a large shrub that can reach up to 66 feet in height. Species of camellia known as zigzag camellia consists of numerous contorted branches because of its stem, which take a twist of 40 degrees at each node of on the branches. Some species of camellia, such as Sasaquina, can be trimmed and cultivated in the form of hedges, topiaries, and espillars. Camellias produce thick, glossy leaves with serrated edges that are alternately arranged on the branches. Camellias develop a large, showy flowers that consist of five to nine white, creamy, yellow, red, or pink petals. Center of the flower is filled with numerous yellow stamens. Some types of camellia produce variegated flowers, which are multicolored or double flowers. Camellia blooms during the autumn, winter, and spring, depending on the geographic location and the type of camellia flower. Flowers are not fragrant but they easily attract bees thanks to their vividly colored petals. Fruit of the camellia is a dry capsule divided into five segments. Each segment is filled with one to eight seeds. Leaves of the camellia are used to manufacture a tea. White and green black tea are just some of the types of tea made from this plant. Tea oil obtained from the seed of the camellia is edible oil that is used for cooking and seasoning of various dishes. This oil is especially popular and widely used in China. Camellia oil is used for nurture the hair in Japan and to clean the blades of instruments used for cutting. Japanese camellia is a state flower of Alabama. In the language of flowers, camellia stands for adoration, devotion, and loveliness. White camellia signify true excellence and faithfulness while red camellia symbolize beauty. Leaves of the camellia are used in traditional Chinese medicine in treatment of asthma and cardiovascular disorders. They're also susceptible to mites, aphids, mealybugs, and various beetles that attack leaves of these plants and produce serious damage in the gardens. Camellia flowers can survive from 100 to 200 years in the wild. Wow, that's a long time. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is prioritize. It's a verb. It means designate or treat something as more important than other things. Prioritize. Our next word of the day is a word you may have heard somewhere in today's video. That word is smatter. It's a noun. It means a small amount of something, smatter. Hola, Discovery Learners. So yo, tu maestra Liz. Hello, Discovery Learners. It is I, your teacher Liz. And ese es tu español, la palabra de la semana. What that means is, here's your Spanish word of the week. La palabra, la palabra para esta semana es cumpleaños. 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 Which means birthday. Cumpleaños. Birthday. Cumpleaños. Birthday. You may use it as a phrase with the previous Spanish word we have already learned. Feliz cumpleaños. Happy birthday. Feliz cumpleaños. Happy birthday. Feliz cumpleaños, which means happy birthday. Try speaking Spanish all week long by saying feliz cumpleaños, which means happy birthday. 
Hasta la semana que viene, Discovery Learners. Be sure to tune in next Monday to learn another Spanish word of the week right here on Ability to Learn. Hey, Discovery Learners. Tis I, Andrew Lancaster, with another list of movies to watch this week. Since Teacher Liz's birthday is right around the corner, let's take a look at some of her favorite movies. One of Liz's favorite sci-fi movies is Star Wars A New Hope. From 1977, this sci-fi film starring Mark Hamill, Harrison Ford, and Carrie Fisher has a two hour and five minute runtime and is available on Disney+. Another one of Liz's favorites is Willow, starring Val Kilmer as Mad Mardigan and Warwick Davis as the titular Willow. This fantasy adventure film has a two hour and six minute runtime, is rated PG, and was filmed in 1987 and you can find it on Disney Plus. Because Teacher Liz is a big fan of anime, let's take a look at film that started it all. Princess Mononoke, rated PG-13 from 1997. This anime drama has a two hour and 14 minute runtime and can be found on HBO Max. And now for a childhood favorite of Liz's, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? This PG film from 1988 combined cartoon animation and live action filming. It stars Bob Hoskins and Christopher Lloyd. It has a 1 hour and 46 minute runtime and is available on Disney+. Plus. Let's take a deeper look at this cinematic work of art. And now for Liz's number one favorite film, E.T. The Extraterrestrial. This PG film from 1982 is a sci-fi film with a 2 hour and 1 minute runtime. It stars Drew Barrymore and Henry Thomas. It was directed by Steven Spielberg and the music was done by John Williams. You can find it on YouTube or DVD. E.T., a friendly alien, is stranded on Earth and forms a bond with a human boy named Elliot. The movie score, created by the legendary John Williams, gives the film a light and whimsical tone which is needed as some of the moments are very suspenseful and scary. The animatronics and puppetry is spectacular. E.T.'s dynamic movement made his presence on screen believable, and you forget he's a puppet and believe he's a cast member and the best friend to our protagonist, Elliot. Steven Spielberg is one of the greatest artists of our day, but E.T. is seldom rivaled in his mastery of emotion. It's immersive and enveloping, and I can see why teacher Liz loves it so much. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that Play-Doh was originally sold as wallpaper cleaner? It's true. In the 1930s, the company Kroger Grocery tasked a man named Noah McVicker and his company Kutol, which was a soap company, to create a particular cleaning agent, which, you know, to clean wallpaper. In the 1930s, Kroger Grocery had a company, Kutol Products, make a wallpaper cleaner that would become Play-Doh later on. The putty that became Play-Doh was originally a wallpaper cleaner and fell out of demand after World War II. That is because back then, households used to heat their homes with coal. Coal produces black soot and other residue that sometimes gets absorbed into wallpaper. After World War II, most homes are transitioning over to oil or gas-based heating. So the cleaning of coal or the soot on wallpaper wasn't needed anymore. The demand for Play-Doh as a cleaning putty declined. McVicker's nephew, Joe McVicker, is the one who had the bright idea. Joe saw a nursery school children playing with the putty as a craft material and took this idea and ran with it in the 1950s. Joe helped rebrand Play-Doh as a children's toy, and it quickly became a nationwide hit. So yeah, Play-Doh was originally a putty used to clean wallpaper. Pretty interesting, huh? Aw, oh, we all know what that song means. It means we reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun! And I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. 
Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you're notified for all the fun here on Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day Program. This is Teacher Liz signing out. Farewell, Discovery Learners. I will see you next time.